This fence separates Mexico from the United States of America. These countries are only a few hundred feet apart, but the differences in the way people live are staggering. Houses in the United States are organized into neat neighborhoods. Houses have front yards, each with its own parking spot. Mexican neighborhoods are much more dense, and people here live in rougher conditions than people on the other side of the fence. They live off lower wages, the poverty level is higher, and crime rates are higher too. Therefore, people from Mexico are very eager to get to the United States. And this fact makes this border one of the busiest and most dangerous borders in the world. But at first glance, it doesn't seem like it. And I wonder why is this border considered one of the most dangerous in the world? And how do people live in this border zone? The border begins in the west, at the Pacific Ocean. It crosses cities, deserts and rivers, and ends in the east, at the Gulf of Mexico. It stretches for thousands of miles along the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico and Texas. If you want me to be exact, it stretches a length of 1,954 miles. This border has its own history, and I could have given you an hour-long lecture on this topic. But I am not going to a history lesson now. So, to sum it up, the land along which this border runs once belonged to Mexico. Then there was the Mexican-American War, Mexico lost, and the United States took parts of the Mexican territories for itself. Then the United States and Mexico argued for a long time about where the line between the countries should go. Finally, they came to an agreement, and this border was drawn. I'm not going to lie, I really want to touch the border. I'm in Mexico, in the city of Tijuana, and I'm looking through the fence at the USA. If this fence didn't exist here, then I could easily step on over into US territory. But I can't do it that easily just as those who want to get from Mexico to the USA can't. For these purposes, this metal wall was built here. But in addition to the wall, there are many more mechanisms in place to prevent illegal immigrants from entering the country. Let's start with these huge fans. The wall is a series of vertical barriers along the border between Mexico and the United States. The total length of this fence is 649 miles, and that covers only one-third the length of the border. The height of the wall and the materials used in the construction vary depending on the section of the wall. The most heavily fortified section is here, between San Diego and Tijuana. Double and triple barriers with a height of 10 to 15 feet are installed on this section of the border. The upper part of the fence is bent towards the territory of Mexico and entangled with barbed wire to make it difficult to overcome the barrier. In some places, there is an additional fence made of metal sheets to prevent any contact on both sides of the border. Between the fences lies a strip of no man's land which the U.S. Border Patrol patrols around the clock using bright searchlights, armed trucks, and video cameras. The presence of such a strip is to make it more difficult for creative violators intending to cross using hydraulic ramps. Surveillance over the U.S. side of the territory adjacent to the fence is carried out with the help of helicopters and off-road vehicles. On the Pacific coast, where the westernmost point of the land border is located, the wall extends a considerable distance into the water. Sections of the border where there is less risk of drug smuggling or armed gang crossings may have less security or no barrier at all. In fact, the barrier can come in the form of a wire fence for livestock, a fence of vertically placed rails, or a fence of concrete-filled steel pipes of a certain length. But in addition to the wall, there are people who guard this border day and night. No day-offs, no holidays. For surveillance, they use many of the most modern technologies. These people are the Border Patrol. And at their disposal, they have these air studs that are tied to the ground 
These aerostats have cameras on them that zoom in for miles and miles away. They can see in the dark with infrared, and they are able to see any sort of movement. Along the border there are ray towers, which have optical equipment installed on them, which allows border guards to see for many miles around. Then there are seismic sensors in the ground that help border patrols detect if anyone is trying to cross the guarded territory. And the sensors help border patrol determine the intruder's direction of movement. Another way that Border Patrol does its job is by using motion sensor cameras. Every time someone walks by, they turn on and start recording. Hunters also often use these cameras to track deer and see where deer are. However, people who are trying to get into the US illegally are constantly coming up with new ideas for how to cross the border. And the Border Patrol is constantly adapting and using new technologies, which makes this job continue to be one of the most dangerous in the world. So, how do people get from Mexico to the US? In order to answer this question, first I need to show you how I got from the US to Mexico. There are two ways to get from San Diego to Tijuana. The first way is to cross over the border in Tijuana on foot. To do this, I got on a trolley in the downtown of San Diego. The trolley took me down to San Isidro station. Literally, thousands of people are able to simply walk over into Mexico every day using this route. I made it from downtown San Diego down to San Isidro station in about 30 minutes. It was a very easy and pain-free ride. Then I walked on over to the pedestrian border crossing bridge. There were no queues at the Mexican checkpoint. Mexican immigration officers quickly checked my passport and allowed me into Mexico. Well, that was fast. I just crossed over the border and I'm in Tijuana. That was the first way to get from the US to Mexico, but there is another way. The second way, and I am going to show it to you now. The second way to cross over the border into Mexico is by car. And yes, for the sake of this video, I crossed the border into Mexico twice in one day. Crossing the border by car turned out to be even easier than on foot. All that was required of me was simply to follow the signs that strictly reminded me that I was approaching the US-Mexico border. All I had to do to cross the border was to slow it down a bit as I drove across. This time I wasn't even asked for any documents. It was the fastest border crossing of my life. Even when I crossed the US-Canada border, it took me much longer. Usually, when we think of Mexico, images are conjured up of either touristy Cancun with its ideal beaches or of modern Mexico City with its urban vibe. Well, Tijuana is different, and it looks like many other Latin American cities. I would describe all Latin American cities in one sentence. The spirit of freedom and scratching your belly attitude are always in the air. I felt like I was in the state of California, but here it wasn't so polished. It wasn't so green, roads were littered with path holes, it was dirtier, and buildings were built in neo-makeshift style. The beaches here are the same as on the other side of the border, but with its own cultural features. This is what the beach in San Diego looks like. People here sunbathe, exercise and relax. And this is what the beach in Tijuana looks like. One thing that caught my eye is that people here enjoy their time at the beach more actively. Concerts are held on the beach, and people openly drink alcohol here. Honestly, I have a feeling that I've arrived in the middle of some kind of city holiday. Now let's get to know Tijuana a little closer. Tijuana is the second largest city in Mexico, and currently Tijuana one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in Mexico. About 2 million people call it home. In short, Tijuana in Mexico is like Los Angeles in the US, only without movies and stars and much cheaper. And the city begins here, on the US-Mexico border. Every year, 
50 million people cross it, making this border one of the busiest in the world. There is, as you understand, an explanation. This border runs alongside the richest U.S. state, California. Every day, thousands of Mexicans commute to the U.S. for work. The fact is that an average salary in Mexico is $14 a day, while in neighboring California, this is the minimum wage per hour. As you understand, the choice is obvious, and it's not in favor of Mexico. But not only Mexicans cross this border, Americans also have reasons to go to Tijuana. For what reason, you might ask? The entertainment industry and nightlife. The lion's share of Tijuana's budget revenue comes from tourism. But how can you lure Californians who have Disneyland, Universal Studios, the Six Flags Amusement Park, and the same coast, and many more tourist attractions into Tijuana? Well, do you remember when I told you about the spirit of freedom and slovenliness? Exactly those things attract Californians. Tijuana is known for its red light district, called Zona Norte. Prostitution is legal in this area. There is also a gambling district called Agua Caliente. Throughout the city, there are also many strip clubs and bars. I'm definitely not going to go to the bars. I retired from that five years ago, but I want to focus on alcohol separately. Can I buy alcohol here if I'm 18? Yes, you can. The legal drinking age in Mexico is 18 years old, compared to 21 in the United States, making Tijuana an attractive destination for high school students and students from Southern California. In short, alcotourism. All these benefits of Tijuana's economy are actively controlled by Mexican mafia. Tijuana is the birthplace and the base of the Tijuana cartel. The crime and violence peaked in 2010. Back then, the wave of violence reached its peak as a result of the turf war between the Tijuana cartel and the Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloa cartel has won. We'll talk about it a little later. But Tijuana is not Chicago in 1920s. If you walk the streets during the day, you will not see a hint of crime. Although sometimes it does happen that careless tourists are stopped and extorted by the police and forced to bribe them. Here is what the police station looks like, by the way. I was no exception. When I finished filming this documentary and was on my way from Tijuana to San Diego, I was stopped by Mexican police. Unfortunately, my camera was off, but here is the footage from my dashcam. As I was approaching the US-Mexico border, I was stopped for no reason by a local policeman. Most likely due to the fact that my car has California plates, and he said that I must pay him a $100 fine now, or I would not be allowed to go any further. And I told him I only had $15. By the way, you can see that other cars weren't stopped. Only mine was. This policeman wasn't happy and in broken English said quickly give me the money and he let me go once he got the money. The exact moment the money was given to the officer wasn't caught on camera. I just got scammed for money. It wasn't $100, it was only $15, but it's still a shame. But there was another incident that was caught on camera. Right when I started filming, I was also stopped by a policeman. What ended up happening, you can see for yourself. Where are you going? You know, to where... the no, I'm going to Zona Norte. Oh, Zona Norte? Zona oh. Norte. Uh, uh, un hotel, dentista, doctor, dentist? Dentista, doctor, yeah. Yeah, Zona Norte, 15 minutes. Tienes direction, address? Uh, yo tengo dirección aquí. Yo tengo uh, uh, un, yes, una mapa aquí. Um, Mira, my car here. Uh, follow him, zona norte, do address, look. $20, follow him, my car. But the story doesn't end here. Here is another video from my dashcam. The fact is that in Tijuana street signage can be a bit confusing. And instead of going downtown, you might easily end up back in the line for the border, without the option of making a U-turn. And that is exactly what happened to me. Certain entrepreneurial locals are aware of this common mistake and eager to earn money, and will offer to get behind the wheel and back your car up and out of the borderline. 
for a small fee, of course. I refused their help, but they threatened that if I didn't use their services, then the policeman who was standing at the entrance to the junction would fine me $65. And if they back my car out for me, then I'd save myself this fine. Here's the cop, by the way. Most likely he is in on this scam. But my friends, I am not so easily fooled. I backed out of the intersection myself and drove on in my mission to show you Tijuana. See how many helpers there are? Everyone wants money. Everyone wants to help. This is how they make money here. In general, driving in Tijuana is a separate art, from which I have long since forgotten. Turning signals here are a formality. If a driver wants to change lanes or turn, he informs others about this with gestures. I've traveled a lot around many different cities, including cities in Asia and Latin America, so such chaotic movements do not bother me much. What confuses me the most here is the police who want to make money, because in the US, where I live, the police usually help and do so for free. They do not try to make a quick buck off of human misfortune. The residents of Duana, who have nothing to do with these crimes and scams, also benefit from the influx of tourists, but they do so in relation to medicine. Tijuana receives 2.5 million tourists who come here for treatment. What for? Healthcare. Americans go to Mexico because healthcare is much cheaper here. So, for example, a dental crown in Mexico will cost you about $200 and about $800 in the US if a person doesn't have dental insurance. People come here and not only treat teeth, they also come here for plastic procedures. Animals are brought to Mexico vets for treatment as well, as it's much cheaper here than in the neighboring US, or El Norte, as Mexicans like to call it. In addition to medicine, there are also a lot of restaurants, street vendors, street taco stands, pharmacies, shops, hotels and souvenir shops, which benefit as well. While we are going to see the historical center of the city, let's take a look at how Tijuana locals live and earn money. Tijuana is a major manufacturing center that, in addition to tourism, serves as the cornerstone of the country's economy. Just in the last decade, Tijuana has become the capital of medical equipment manufacturing in all of the North American continent, overtaking previous leaders, U.S. cities Minneapolis and St. Paul. The city's proximity to Southern California and its large-skilled and relatively inexpensive workforce make it an attractive city for foreign companies that are building assembly plants in Duana. Such plants are called Miqueladoras. In short, there is a free trade agreement between the US and Mexico for the export of products. It's called NAFTA. And international companies actively take advantage of all these characteristics. They pay meager salaries and send goods to the US and only pay a small import tax. Finally, we have arrived. Now let's see what the city center looks like. Downtown Tijuana is a mixture of modern buildings and colonial architecture, which is lavishly decorated with advertising. There are many street vendors in this area trying to sell you anything you can imagine. There are also a huge number of cafes from which friendly but pushy Mexican waiters try to rope you in for margaritas. I confess that when I was preparing for this video, I read a lot of scary stories about Tijuana, so I feel uncomfortable being here, but outwardly people look friendly. The combination of broken down roads, worn out buildings and homeless people roaming around downtown can at first be a bit frightening. If you aren't here for the nightlife, then there is nothing special to do in the city center. Now I want to show you residential areas and how people live here. People here live quite simply in small houses, which they try to enlarge with makeshift outbuildings. 
It caught my eye that practically all the houses are hidden behind fences and there are bars on the windows on the lower floors. I drove through several residential areas and they were all more or less like that. By the way, about the roads, they leave a lot to be desired here, to put it mildly. How do you like living here in Tijuana? Wow, well, it's a pretty place to live. It's a good place to live. Much cheaper than the United States? They do. Now let's talk about real estate prices here. Renting a one-bedroom apartment in Tijuana starts at $450. In nearby San Diego, a similar apartment will cost you anywhere starting from $1,800 per month. Purchasing a small 1,200 square foot house in Tijuana will cost you around $85,000. And in the neighboring American San Diego, you will not find anything like this for less than $600,000. For that kind of money in Tijuana, you can buy a house on the coast with the ocean view. Everywhere you look, you can see the huge price differences compared to neighboring California. A modest lunch for one person in California will cost you $10 to $15, in Tijuana $5. Coffee in California costs you around $5, in Tijuana $1.50. We have seen the highlights, and so now we circle around back to the question that I asked at the very beginning of the video. How does one get back to the US legally? To answer that, I'm heading back to the border. The border separating Mexico and the United States is the most frequently crossed international border in the world, with approximately 350 million legal crossings taking place annually. There are 48 US-Mexico border crossings, with 330 ports of entry. The largest part of the border is shared between Texas and Mexico. They share 1,254 miles of the border and are joined by 28 international bridges and border crossings. This number includes two dams, one hand-drawn ferry, and 25 other crossings that allow commercial, vehicular, and pedestrian traffic. The most obvious way to get from Mexico to the United States is by plane, but we are not considering this option today. You can make a land crossing back into the United States by walking through one of the 48 border crossings along the border. I'm going to cross the border here, through the San Isidro point of entry. But it's not that easy, because thousands of people are here with me and also waiting for their turn to cross the border. Every day, 63,000 people cross this border on foot, making this border not just busy, but the busiest in the world. To cross this border, people commonly make lines of up to a mile in length or more. Everyone is equal here, men and women with children, old and young. Remember how quickly I crossed over into Mexico at this very same point of entry? Well, it usually takes people several hours to cross the border from Mexico into the United States. To give you an idea of how long the line is, I spent about two hours standing in it. Here is a video sped up 120 times. And along this line there is a brisk trade of everything you can think of. There are clothing stores and stalls with food and alcohol, pharmacies, cafes, as well as grocery stores and souvenir shops. If you look up, then you can find this sign. Under it, there is a regular line. And next to it, there is another one like this. This is the line for people who have a special US issued pass. It's called Sentry. Only citizens or residents of America can get it by passing a thorough background check. Since the validity of this pass also applies to cars, the holders of such passes actively walk along the line and offer their services as taxi drivers who can quickly transport you to the US. This pleasure is worth $40. Not too shabby for a 10-minute drive. To be honest, when I saw this line, I thought that I would have to spend the rest of the day in it. But the line moved pretty fast. I won't wait in this line any longer, I want to show you another way to cross the border. The second way to get to the United States is to cross the border by car. These methods will not surprise anyone, but the peculiarity of this place is that every day 85,000 cars cross the border here, and sometimes the line of cars stretches for many miles, which means you can get stuck in this tremendous traffic jam for several hours.
But the most tiresome thing about being in this line is not the several hour long wait, but the fact that here children walk between the cars and back for money. Usually I don't give money because I don't know what the money will be spent on. It might be spent on drugs or alcohol, but I always carry some food and fruits with me to hand out. Right now I do feel like giving these kids money, but my last $15 were taken from me by the policeman I previously mentioned and I have no more cash. And it's a very heartbreaking to see children in need. There is also trade between cars, only more mobile. Here they sell all the same churros, hats, souvenirs and water bottles. Nothing new, but there were some sellers who really surprised me. Here, for some reason, they sell statues of Virgin Mary, crosses and similar paraphernalia. How many hours does she work? How many hours? Yeah, every day, every single day. Oh, like uh, four hours. Four hours. And four hours? Yeah. And how much money? Depends, like uh, eight dollars, a hundred dollars a day. But, but not every day. Not every day. While I'm waiting for my turn to cross the border, I would like to say a few words about the inhabitants of Duana in particular and Mexicans in general. Yes, in Duana some people did try to rip me off quite a bit, but many people also helped me. There is one situation that I want to tell you about, which wasn't caught on camera. When I got lost while filming this, I couldn't find a parking lot, and one taxi driver took time out of his day and drove for about 10 minutes in front of me in order to show me the way. Yes, there are people who are tolerant of corruption, but for the most part they are accommodating and friendly. All throughout my time in Tijuana, no one showed aggression towards me, even though I was filming them. All right, I have talked enough. Back to the border. After a few hours of waiting, I drove up to the border patrol. Border agents do their best to identify the most suspicious individuals from this endless stream of cars and people in order to prevent the smuggling of drugs and illegal immigrants into the United States. What's a common place to check? The trunk. To detect drugs, trained dogs are taken for a walk between the rows of cars. In particular, the dogs sniff the tires of cars, which are often a preferred hiding place used by smugglers. Due to the fact that I crossed the border into the United States twice in one day, I probably also showed up as a suspicious person, so they arranged a little additional search for me, checking the trunk of my car and asking me why I crossed the border twice in one day. I replied that I did it for the sake of art, my viewers and for my subscribers on YouTube. For all 10 of you. If they had wanted to check me further, they would have sent me to a separate parking lot, where my car would have been thoroughly examined. But this didn't happen. But getting from Mexico to the US is not easy. To do this, you need to have either a resident permit or US citizenship. But not everyone has a US visa, residence permit or US citizenship. Still, many people want to go to America. And people cross the border illegally in two ways. The first way is to do this by crossing illegally through the Sonoran Desert. This desert is located in the US states of Arizona and California and Mexican states of Baja California and Sonora. The center of the Sonoran Desert is where you will find the city of Phoenix, the capital of Arizona. On the map, the Sonoran Desert is an empty stretch land the size of Connecticut, a sea of nothing. But in fact, this desert is a huge cemetery for illegal immigrants. For those determined to enter the United States, this is a way in. A fence that can be crossed, an empty land with few watching eyes, a promise of a route north. But in reality, there is no way across without finding extra water and without smugglers, known as coyotes, as guides. And both the smugglers and the land are harsh. 
For 27 years, 11,000 people who have tried to illegally cross the desert from Mexico into the United States have died here. Right now, currently we're in the middle of the Indian Reservation, approximately 70 miles from Tucson. We picked up three illegal aliens who called 911. They were in the desert for two days and two nights. They walked approximately 20, 22 miles. They had to walk up the top of this ridge to get cell phone coverage. They made the call, it went to the Pima County Dispatch, which allowed us to get within 23 meters of the group. You know, there's nothing around here within, there's no Indian villages within 12 miles from here. No. What, what would happen if he hadn't had cell phone coverage? What was your plan? He didn't have cover. Well, if he, if he didn't get a hold of us, what, what, yeah. what, was, your, what was your plan? I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll probably die. At 10 a.m. in the summer, the temperature can reach 105 Fahrenheit. Some time ago, I was in this desert in the winter filming a video about Arizona, and I could only tolerate being here half an hour. Illegal immigrants are usually escorted by smugglers, guys who are very cruel to the people they lead through the desert. This is a very hard, dangerous, and often deadly path. So people die here, and they continue dying. The second way to get into the US illegally is much more difficult and much more expensive. And for this story, we need to travel to the neighboring state of Arizona. And not only that, we also need to travel back in time to the year 1990. It was then that something was discovered in the border town of Douglas that surprised even the most experienced of border guards. They discovered a tunnel that started in Mexico and ended in the US. When they went down into it, they were even more surprised. The tunnel was not only well hidden and designed, but it even had lighting and ventilation. This tunnel was built by the largest and the most dangerous Mexican drug cartel the Sinaloa cartel, to bring drugs into the United States. And so began a new chapter in the history of the joint struggle between the US and Mexican authorities against the drug trade – tunnels. Since 1990, the influence of Sinaloa cartel along the US-Mexico border has only increased. The most famous head of this cartel was Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Luera, better known as El Chapo, and the tunnels became a solution for them in their aim to find a way to smuggle trucks and people into the United States. The cartel became interested in one particular section of the border, an area of San Diego called Ote Mesa. I came to this area to find out why it was so attractive to the Sinaloa cartel. And they chose this place for three reasons. The first reason is transport accessibility. This place is a very large transport hub, where there are two airports in the cities of San Diego and Tijuana. On the top of that, this place has a very well-developed transport infrastructure, warehouses, roads, and a lot of freight transport. These two factors made it easy for them to get drugs to the border and then across into dealers' hands on the other side of the border. The second reason, this is a busy, noisy industrial area. On the US side, there are warehouses in the Ote Mesa area. On the Mexican side, there is the Tijuana airport. All these factors help drug traffickers to remain unnoticed. The third reason is the soil. To the west is the ocean, where the soil is quite wet. To the east, the solid rock of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Therefore, this area was ideal for building tunnels. The ground was soft enough to dig the tunnels, yet hard enough to keep them from collapsing. Here is a tunnel found in November 2010. Electricity and ventilation were installed inside the tunnel. Rails were installed on the floor, similarly to those in mines that were built during the gold rush. Using these rails, construction workers were able to quickly move large amounts of soil out on trolleys during construction of the tunnel. And so, just like mines during the gold rush, this tunnel was used for its intended purpose – to smuggle drugs into the United States. From the moment the first tunnel was found in Arizona, up until now, about 200 more tunnels have been discovered on the US-Mexico border. Millions of dollars are needed to build such tunnels. 
but such tunnels pay off, otherwise they wouldn't be built. These tunnels are so big that literally tons of drugs can be moved through them. And these tunnels make the border and its surveillance even more difficult and dangerous. Since drug cartels are behind the constructions of these tunnels, violence is never too far away. This is why thousands of people flee from Latin America to the United States. For many thousands of years, people have been drawing lines on the Earth that divide the Earth into nations. These lines are called borders. And as long as there are rich states and poor states, people will always strive to obtain the benefits of a more prosperous neighbor in any way they can, both legally and illegally. And while there are countries that do not care about their citizens, their populations will live for those countries where human life is valued more. And as long as there are weak states, strong and dishonest states will try to redraw the border of the weak. Unfortunately, this is the state of affairs in our modern world. To complete this story, I return to the place where I started it. Only this time I am on the other side of the fence. Do you know what I see now after all this traveling I've done? I see that the wall has changed. Now, for me, this is not just a metal fence. This is a place that tells many stories. Stories of separated families. Stories of how someone's dream came true or collapsed. It tells me a story about travel, adventure, human greed and heroism. Most importantly, it tells me a story about us. Thank you.